Okay. Uh, well, we have a really huge audience. I'm super happy for that. Uh, okay, uh, now I will give voice to uh, Dominika uh, Blachinska Czatek. Uh, who is a sociologist, a visual sociologist, but also has an experience, extensive experience of uh, leading uh, research in the Middle East, and also uh, was dealing with the collective memory, individual memory in this uh, area, and uh, artists who are already for uh, uh, for a while like dealing with the issues we'll be talking about uh, today. Uh, Yasmina Wojcik, um, it's uh, mostly um, pedagogies and uh, activists and artists engaged uh, for now a good uh, while of time on working with the community engaged projects. And Yasmina uh, recently uh, was awarded many, many times as the director of the Symphony uh, of Ursus, a beautiful documentary that is like also extending the borders of what documentary means, working for how many years, Yashmina? Like uh, eight years with the community uh, of former tractors factory uh, that it's uh, in Warsaw, like used to be in Warsaw, like now it's uh, closed and with uh, former workers of this uh, factory using the tools uh, that are coming from the field of arts as well. Uh, I would like also to, uh, and maybe one thing more, uh, Yashmina took part in Kalandia International three years, uh, two, last year, two, uh, 2018, uh, and she was collaborating with Mohamed Saleh, who is our resident right now, who is uh, now I can also call you artist, maybe, but uh, mostly uh, activist and also art tech, permaculturist, and also someone who is using uh, a, a lot of uh, like gardening, cultivating your ground in his practice uh, in order to change, shift uh, some social uh, relations. And I would also like to. Uh, introduce you uh, Jumana Emil Abut, uh, who is a visual artist who's making drawings and who is very much engaged in the oral, uh, uh, oral history. And uh, like, I especially appreciate narrative projects of uh, Jumana, like treating the language uh, as a tool. It's uh, very interesting. And uh, Jumana will be actually a resident uh, in frame of our exchanges. Uh, she next year uh, will be hosted by uh, Er Antwerpen. So, uh, get started and thank you for your... Hello, is that working? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ika, so much for, uh, for the invitation and for putting together this wonderful uh, panel. Um, so, 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 so the theme of this session really is to talk about the everyday forms of resistance. So the theme of our panel is, is very related to the sort of overarching uh, title of, 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 of the assembly. So I think it's really fought as, uh, as a reflection time for us because I know that you're in the middle of your project. Um, some of you haven't even started. And also we are ahead of the uh, big exhibition. So, so kind of, I think of today maybe a sort of work in progress our ideas in progress and I would also like to open up the floor for you as, as, as soon as possible. Um, so everyday forms of resistance. Um, I guess I'm, I'm very aware of where we are having this panel and uh, uh, when I was preparing for our conversation I, I remember this quote from Edward Said uh, from the introduction of his book After the Last Sky and back in, I think, 1982, he writes that uh, for all that has been written about Palestinians, they remain largely unknown for the Western uh, slash Polish um, audiences. Or when you think about Palestinian, he writes, you either think of a figure of a refugee, often a helpless refugee that needs our support or aid, or a terrorist slash freedom fighter. 
And he speculates, or he argues that, and it, it's back in 1982, that the everyday life of Palestinians is virtually um, unknown. Fast forward 40 years, uh, I would think the same is still the case, the same remain the case, especially in places like, like Poland, although it hasn't been like that always. Um, but I think uh, uh, even more is the case when we think about uh, Palestinians in the context of resistance. So um, here we do hear about Palestinian resistance, but exclusively or largely in one context. We hear about it in the context of military resistance. So people in Poland would know of Hamas and, and Gaza, uh, and the narrative would often be Hamas shelling Israeli citizens. So we know of this type of resistance. Um, some people would remember um, the two inf intifadas and especially second intifada. However, not many people in Poland would be aware of um, the everyday struggle of, of, of Palestinians uh, under the occupation. So of everyday realities of wasting time at the checkpoints, of having to maneuver through the kind of roadblocks, closures, and, uh, um, and, and the geography of occupied Palestinian territories. Not many people would know about siege, siege of Gaza. Um, so, uh, so, 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 so the everyday lives and, um, uh, of Palestinian population remain vi virtually unknown to the to, to majority. Uh, of, of Polish people. This is why I also think it's really important to, you know, to talk about uh, these everyday forms of resistance and also to reflect whether this everyday struggle, this everyday being of Palestinian people under the occupation um, is conceptualized by, by Palestinians themselves as resistance. And I remember one of my, my, my really favorite uh, um, Palestinian authors, um, Lila Abu Lugold, uh, has uh, writing about actually Egyptian Bedouin women and, 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 and the way in which they resist different structures of power, warned against romanticizing this big resistance and really focus on and uh, encourage us to, to think of everyday forms. Uh, another academic, Sam Hughes, uh, uh, spoke about you know, our attentiveness to this unintentional forms of resistance, something that uh, is a fabric of life and might not have an uh, intention of being against something, but because of the way it is operated, it, it works, becomes an act of resistance. Uh, so really, without further ado, I would like to give uh, the floor to, 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 to our wonderful panel, wonderful ar artist. And, and really, um, what we would do, uh, I ask each and every of them to, to prepare a 10, 15 minutes uh, presentation of their work. Uh, and I can't wait to hear you talking about this. But also, like, uh, I would also like to ask you already one question. So how do you situate? Your, your work, uh, what you will be presenting in relation to, uh, to the topic of our, of our, of our conversation. And um, also to, in, to include you more in our conversation, I think um, Jumana will start and then we will follow with, with Mohammed and Yasmina. But after each presentation, if you have any pending questions, uh, we will open the floors for your questions. Jumana, the floor is Once upon a time, in a land so far and so near, there was a river of great Visa, they called it. Not far from the river, there lived a man whose name was Maruf. Maruf in Arabic means the one who is known, or maybe the all-knowing one. Maruf was a very good-hearted man, but he felt so desperately unhappy. And there were two reasons for that. The first was that he was lacking a wife and children. And the second was that there was so much violence and barbarism in the place where he lived. So he decided to pack his bags and just tour the world. And he started uh, his adventures 
And maybe his adventures took him three days, or maybe they took him an entire lifetime. And then one day, he came across a village that was not drawn on any map. And as soon as he came very close to the village, he saw weeping by the village well, a beautiful maiden. She was weeping and weeping. And he immediately fell in love with her as soon as he saw her. He had to know why she was crying. So he approached her. And he soon learned, Maruf soon learned, that her name was Almaza. Almaza meaning the one who illuminates like the diamond. And he soon learned that Almaza was weeping because the village ghul, the monster or the goblin of the village, had taken, had kidnapped all of her brothers and her cousins and had taken them down into his abode where he lived inside this deep, deep well. Of course, because Maruf is the hero of our story, he vows to save them. And he prepares himself to jump into the well and to find out what has happened to the brothers and cousins of Almaza. And immediately, as soon as he jumps into the well, he finds himself right in the middle of the ghoul's kitchen. And he finds the ghoul finishing off the meat from the last, from the bones of his last victim. And the ghoul sees him and he says to him, Ah, you're my next victim! Now, Maruf, because he is all knowing and he knows exactly how he should deal with monsters. A lifetime of adventures has taught him that, right? We all would agree that a lifetime of adventures teaches us, no? So as soon as the ghoul sees him and is ready to jump on him and eat him alive, Maruf says to him, wait, 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 wait. At least before you, you know, you're gonna have me for your dessert, don't you wanna know what dessert that I've, that what gifts I've brought you? And the ghoul's eyes widen, and he, you know, imagines what kind of gifts he's going to get because he is so greedy. He loves gifts. And Maruf continues to play the game and then says to the whole, well, before I give you the gift, how about you tell me what's around here, your home? What's around your kitchen? For example, what is that jar behind you? And the whole says, oh, these are in that jar are all of the eyes and all of the souls of all the living men that I've ever captured. And I'll tell you a secret, if this jar was about to smash, then all of the souls would return to their rightful bodies and we would have real men back in the universe again. And what about this, the stick, what's the stick? Maruf insists he wants to buy some more time and the ghoul says to him, oh, this stick is a magic stick. If you hit this stick with your, with if you hit the thief with the stick, for example, he will uh, give you back everything he's ever stolen from you. And here I want to tell you a secret. If you come across any monsters in the path of your life, you need to remember to only hit them once. Because if you hit them more than once, you will only be reviving them, bringing them back to life. So what do you think Maruf does? Now let's get to the, to the short end of this long story because trust me, it's a long story. So to make a long story short, Maruf takes the magic stick, he smashes the jars. Of course, he understands that in one of those jars is also the soul of the very, mo the very monster that he's visiting. So first he smashes that jar and he kills, he hits the ghoul with one, one time with that stick. And so he kills the ghoul. Then he smashes the rest of the jars. He releases all of the souls and eyes. They all return to their rightful bodies. All of the men return to their rightful homes. He obviously returns to Almaza. They marry. They have the most magical of weddings. There's so much dancing and food and happiness and joy. And I know because I was there. Now this is my story. Be careful, don't fall. This is my story that I've told it, and in your hands, I leave it. And this is just one story of the many hundreds of stories that I was told as a child. 
And in my practice as a visual, as a creative practitioner, I was really struggling after having lived in Canada. We immigrated. I was living in Canada with my family. And then 13 years after living in Canada, we moved back to Palestine. And there I find so much of a disconnection with the place that's meant to be my home. So it takes me a very long time to try to understand, you know, I try to um, create uh, new ways of understanding it, learning the language, my Arabic was very bad, probably some will agree it still is pretty bad, and other, you know, other things. And, uh, and then about 10 years ago, I remembered that, of course, there was many failures along this practice, along this process of my creative thinking. And then about 10 years ago, I realized that I was running away from the one thing that always made me feel close to home. And it was these stories, it was these children's stories. As wild as they are, as violent as they were, there was something about these stories that connected us to the landscape. And so then I started on a very long and slow path of trying to revisit these tales again. And at first I started from that very close, familiar place, from my village of Schwamer, and asking my mother, my aunts, my grandmother to tell me again what were the stories that they told us as children. So the first, I guess now when I look back at it, I can say that in this over, over the last 10 years, this process of my trying to reconnect with my idea of home and to feel like I need to find my voice for what does home mean. I need to reinvent that. I cannot have it being told to me. And, uh, and this long process perhaps can be divided the way that I see it anyway, into these three uh, parts or three phases or three elements. A first element has to do with the talismans. Um, so what were the particular objects that we were collecting? And I'll start from here. And it was in, um, uh, it was one of the great resources that I came across was the Tawfiq Kanaan collection in the Birzeit University. Tawfiq Kanaan, I will not say very much about him because we're very late with time, although he has been my uh, guide in, uh, throughout my uh, research. And so this first element was the talismans. And Tawfiq Kanaan was a physician and an ethnographer who studied the, uh, talisman, uh, the talismans and the votives of the, the Palestinians of the 1920s specifically. And he wrote even lots about that. And then thankfully his collection was reserved, preserved in the Birzeit University. And um, so inspired by this, uh, one of the first projects that I, um, that I started to do was reconnecting with what people today carry in their pockets or under their pillows or in their, you know, in their homes. What do you have that you feel is, has some symbolic object for you that could be anything? For me, for example, this was the scarf of my grandmother that she wore to church every Sunday. And so then I created a series of works and the works took on many different shapes and forms from uh, photography to painting, drawing, um, uh, video, and uh, then eventually performance and storytelling. Um, another form that uh, they also took was when uh, I decided to, to find specific components in the stories and uh, for me, who were the role, uh, who were the actors, and what roles did they play in these stories? A lot of my work deals with the presence of the female, and so then I wanted to look at the stories from the female perspective of how they were trying to um, kind of, uh, I mean, maybe they were using the stories to shape these young, myself included, the, you know, the young girls into how they should be and how should they, they should, what they should be aspiring to. And I know that that exists all around the world in fairy tales everywhere. So then the second kind of phase was focusing on a specific uh, story about the girl whose hands were cut off. So there again, I worked with various metaphors about this whole, um, what does it mean to lose your sense of touch? And what would happen if you lost an integral part of who you are? So in, the, in that sense, comparing as well how Palestinians are completely cut off from their homeland or cut off from a language or cut off from anything, that you have every right, that it is your every right. 
So what happens when someone just thieves it away from you? And there I went back to kind of these everyday childhood, childhood rituals that we used to do. And one of them was we, you know, the landscape was always our playground. And so we explored the landscape, we fell, we, uh, we got up again. And one of these specific, uh, what, what you see in this image is a thorn that we used to try to get, um, it, it omits a red pigment and uh, we used to call it the thorn of uh, the Virgin Mary or the thorn of uh, the blood of Jesus. And we used to like compete who could get the most dots on their hand. Um, so that's what you see me doing here. And this was part of, this is a still in fact from the video. So I was looking at the everyday rituals of our childhood from stories and trying to um, uh, almost defragment them and look at them from the, all of the angles, from who were the players who, and what were their roles, what were the objects, and what were the spaces. And then that led me to the third and more, I guess, current uh, process of working, which deals with the actual haunted sites, which again takes me back to Tawfiq Kanan, who wrote a wonderful... That's my timer, I'm on 12 minutes, so I'll finish in one more minute. Um, so that left me to investigating where are those haunted locations. So uh, then in 2014, using Tawfiq Kanan's study on uh, water demons in Palestine, he had listed all of the locations, at least as far as he had noted them, and in particular in the Jerusalem region, actually. So then I also went back to Galilee and said, well, where are those haunted locations that I was told about? And by haunted, I mean that we were told that there were many natural, uh, there were sources in nature that we were not allowed to visit as children. And a lot of them had to do with trees, water sources, caves, canals. So it's a kind of, uh, perhaps, you know, our parents feared our, our going away, you know, and not coming back or disappearing and, and or falling into these wells. Um, so I, I started to, um, I started a kind of a research in trying to map out where are those locations and how do they look today. And that's where the research has led me. And of course, it, again, it has taken on many, many various forms. And then, un, um, unsatisfied with just producing art and showing in exhibitions, and many of you who have listened to me talk in these working sessions have heard me rant about how I'm so, um, I'm, I'm becoming, uh, yeah, a kind of um, questioning what is the role of an exhibition. So then I, um, I started to really initiate more community projects. So when, when invited for an exhibition, I would in fact want to meet the women in that, uh, or children in that, uh, in that region, and uh, try to do workshops with them, and try to collect stories, create talismans together. So this was, for example, one, one such project. And then, um, and then we, we created these kinds of, uh, uh, how is it called when you have um, uh, tokens? Like you have wedding gifts or wedding tokens. So then we create these wedding tokens, but they're performance tokens. So you put the talismans in there with some candy and they're good wishes, good intentions. And then uh, this workshop is followed by, I collect stories from them and stories from their lives or stories that they were told as children and they're not all necessarily Palestinian. And then I try to retell these stories without giving any specific names in a performance, which then um, uh, ends with my sharing these gifts and giving them away. So then the, the, uh, the listener of these tales has been gifted something from the story. So that's one, one aspect of it. This was something else as well that was in the, a similar project where I worked with women uh, in last year's Tate Live exhibition. And then, I'll just go through this. And then this was actually a very, um, a very special workshop that I, for me it was very special because I worked with these boys from El Arub refugee camp along the same lines of trying to collect stories from them. But I cannot impose these stories and the stories that I wanted, like that I was hearing from them were not fairy tale stories as well. Many times these stories are not folk tale stories. Many times they're just stories that can be so unbelievable that they're so hard to believe that you might as well think that they are fiction. So we, we, um, we worked together in, and I just asked them to take me, like to take all of us around the camp and to, um, to speak to us about, you know, how is this their home? And, um, and then more recently with 
an extension of a course I gave in, uh, in Jerusalem at the Quds Bard College, Quds University. It was a course called Forgetting About Water. And so I'll, in, I'll conclude with this, that more recently my research has made, has, um, kind of is leading me to focus a lot more on water uh, sources. And then in this particular extension of the course, I, um, I work together with my students to find out ways of how we can rediscover the landscape or re and in order to reinvent, if we wanted to, our belonging or our sense of belonging in this place. Because before we can follow someone else's story, we need to have the chance to, to voice our story. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'll just end here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, please. That was my question. Do you have any questions? Yes, please. Uh, no, because I didn't get it. I'm, I'm super. It's super fascinating, and I, I love the the idea. But uh, of the of the project of the stories. But I, I just wanted to ask: Do, do you ask the people um, to tell um, their own stories they experienced, or the stories they know? So, are they real stories or fiction or? Yes, thank you, Kuba. They're bo it's both. I ask them to open up. I ask them to tell me stories either from their childhood, either uh, folk tales that they know um, or remember, or stories from their, um, from their real life, or stories that happened in real life to a friend or a mother. Or and I have to say as well in this respect that a lot of times this kind of open uh, invitation is also very intimate. So we send out a call and it's an, it's an open and it's by invitation uh, only. So it's usually very intimate uh, kind of um, uh, or small uh, group uh, settings and you, you have the freedom to share your story or not. And I've also found that a lot of times if I've done these kind of story sharing outside of Palestine, very often those that remember the folk tales are refugees or immigrants, like living uh, not in their home, but somehow being connected to their home through the magic, through like seeing this, the homeland in, in this oral history or in this magical uh, element. That's what I've so far observed. Any other questions? I do have one question. Um, so I was wondering to what extent this, this, this tradition of telling stories, the, the stories that grandma would tell to their grandchildren, how, you know, to what extent, how strong it is in, in Palestine and outside Palestine mm -hmm. in the age of smartphones and sort of digitalization of, of, of our life. Mm -hmm. And also to what extent the stories change, because also I understand, you know, this folk stories have always been a response to what has been going on mm. in the sort of immediate and world and bigger world. So I'm curious whether you are also tracing these changes. I don't, I, so far, I don't think that the stories have changed. I think these stories belong to a specific era, era a time. And when I was, uh, when I started to map out where those, you know, so-called haunted locations are, I was together with uh, my partner, my creative partner, Isa Frej. And we were trying, you know, trying to find these locations. And there's no map. There's no, not, there's no place that says to you, oh, that's where, you know, you will go to find this well. So we end up asking people, you know, hey, Muhammad, hey, da, uh, Yasmina, like, do you, have you heard of this well? Okay, where can I find it? And uh, then they end up telling you, you know, uh, where it is if they know. But usually anyone who is under the age of 80 doesn't know the story. And, uh, and of course, I think it's also not just... You know, there are many reasons for that. Um, but, you know, again, I don't want to go, go in there. And I think that there's, there is something in the act of storytelling which was communicative and collaborative. And it was the woman who shared these stories. Today, you will find these story expressions as entertainment where theaters like Palestinian National Theater will have, you know, as their highlight, Il Hakawati, the storyteller. Uh, who is telling these uh, these stories and as a form of again a form of entertainment more than and when I try to tell some of these stories to my nieces and nephews they're they're just too scary for them so it's another language it's another time 
And uh, the reason that I'm also doing this is because I want to reflect on how these very, um, uh, you know, stories that had so much uh, fear and power in them and courage, all of these, you know, men, m mixed emotions, how they were in fact teaching us to be steadfast, uh, resilient, uh, strong individuals. And uh, if, if that's what you took from the story, I think. And, uh, and, I, and I know that I still need to do a lot more research, but these stories were also very active in, um, during the Intifada, when they were kind of used as, again, forms of empowerment. So, yeah, it just can, there's no end to it. I hope I've answered your question. Right, thank you so much. Uh, we need to, and we want to move on, for a while at least. Uh, let us hear from Mohammed. Okay, uh, it will be a marathon, uh, sorry to say, but it's uh, packed photos. I saw that you had 14, this is 75. So I will run, I will apologize already, especially for the translators, but they can translate me as saying blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is a response, as you asked, to the title, to what we are doing here. And the idea that came to me is very simple to show what I'm exposed to in my environment, living in Bethlehem, in Palestine, and everywhere that I go back home, and what I'm doing about it since I started doing something about it. So this uh, happy little head is me. Um, I see everything uh, nature and garden, and that's my perspective on things. You said you don't put lenses, but I have these kind of lenses. Of course, he's more um, uh, handsome because he has more hair. Uh, but this grassroot uh, thing is uh, the initiative that I work through with my community. It's called Mustadam, and it means sustainable. It's not a common word. Now it's becoming common, but when I started, it wasn't forgotten because the English word takes over. So before I uh, start showing, you heard from a lot of people before me, and you will hear in the next days as well, we have a very... Uh, a massive uh, like wrong balance back home between who has the power and who doesn't have the power in terms of weapons and military. And this question, what shall we do, I think uh, bangs in the head of everybody living back home or any problematic place. What shall we do about it? What kind of thing? And I will mark the, the, the word do very much because I was raised in an environment where uh, the, the, the parents will meet a lot and uh, the family and they will always talk uh, academic stuff, problematic stuff, uh, the Israeli design of our life, the problem of being so weak and failure as a community and so on. And, and that didn't, me, didn't make me good as a child. I felt weak, I felt I can't. And I was looking for what I can do for 28 years until on a farm in Turkey I was able to finally uh, realize that if I put uh, my hand in hand with nature, um, there is two things that, two main things that I'm concerned about and maybe I can contribute to. One is that Palestinians are vulnerable in the sense that they are dependent on the Israeli occupation in many ways that I will show. Uh, so self-sufficiency is the first answer. So empowering the self. And the second thing is that we are internationally harming nature. So maybe this is a way for me to also uh, uh, think global but act local. So to link these two things that I care about the most. So uh, this is uh, from one of uh, my teachers that 
everything can be sold in a garden. And of course, it's, it's very simple to think like that. There is a lot of layers connected to what is working with nature and with gardens. So I think I will be able only to talk at the top in this presentation. So we have food dependency. This is the veg seller I buy from, my vegetables. And he says one time when I entered that Israelis are on holiday. If Israelis are on, ho are ho or are on holiday, a religious holiday, uh, and they're off and not working, on the third, fourth day, he doesn't have stock. It means in Bethlehem, I'm buying my food that is sold from Israel. So I'm dependent on the Israelis to sell me my food, Israeli tomatoes. Uh, this guy, Bill Mollison, the founder of permaculture, which means permanent culture, mm, well, it's, uh, it's against the, the concept you're talking about, temporariness, but it's not about making permanent culture somewhere, it's about becoming sustainable culture in a way. And he talks about very simple concept, just if we turn from consumers to producers, a lot of problems are solved and 10% of us can provide enough food and we have more unemployed people in Palestine. So these concepts are not new and we don't need to import them from Bill Mollison uh, or from permaculture because they already existed in Palestine in the first intifada and in the second world war here in uh, Europe uh, where people planted plants to be sustainable, to not need to buy things from the oppressor. This uh, movie I really recommend talking about Victory Gardens and also about uh, being sufficient with milk uh, using cows that the military, Israeli military was looking for and never found. It's an amazing story. So I started at my doorstep. This is my uh, parents-in-law um, garden. I uh, transformed it into this in the middle just to give you a scale. This is Zarb, uh, which is uh, an underground oven, it's this big, so this is from the top. And I started experimenting of how I can be self-sufficient in my life to my family first. And uh, later on I moved to this very little balcony and Ika and the friends that visit me already know that I try to make the most food on uh, this balcony. Happily, I um, moved to one month, ag one month uh, ago to a new house where I have more space. So, simple things like one million trees were uprooted by the Israeli army, more than one million olive trees. And uh, the reaction is not only by me, is simply one of the things we can do is plant trees. This initiative here is called uh, To Be There. It's an initiative from Bethlehem. It's a political initiative. This guy in the middle uh, plants and pick up olives like many other initiatives around Palestine. So these kind of reactions from everybody in different ways is really important. Water dependency. So our water in, in, in the West Bank comes completely as far as I know, from Israel. They, in, in Oslo Accords, uh, controlled all our uh, uh, um, underground water. Uh, and uh, it stays that we buy this food, uh, this uh, water. Uh, we use much less, according to statistics, than, an, than a normal person. And Israelis use two and a half, three times more water. And if the military doesn't like you, they will shoot your tanks on top of the house and you're out of water for usually 15, 19 days until it comes back again. So that's why everybody has tanks on their roofs. One of the things that I thought about in this sense is developing this system. It's called Top Pot. It's fully recycled. You will see it in the movie in Yasmina's uh, session. But it con combines four ways of saving water. This can go for one month without watering. And usually we need to water every second day. I will not get, go into details. But one of the things is that it works in, a, in an osmosis where we learn from nature that soil can suck water from under it up. So instead of watering here, on top we water in the bottom and then we let soil drink as much as it needs. Uh, so this very little techniques like this installed on the roof. I will, I will talk more about this project later on. Loss of farmlands. So the Israeli wall separates farmers and people from their land. Uh, so just to give you a hint, uh, the wall is massive and it's now 
getting to more than 440 kilometers. So if you thought the Berlin Wall is like the lesson for humanity not to do it again, we have it. We have a bigger one. And we have also apartheid. So uh, humanity doesn't learn somehow. Uh, so my reaction to this is, okay, one day the Zionist, uh, the Zionist system will be gone because no, in history we learned that there is no power that stays, no empire, no uh, sustain, unsustainable system stays. So this can be the biggest or largest vertical farm in the world because we don't need to throw this cement somewhere and pollute nature, but we can use it. Of, of course, I'm not proposing this system, but just to give a hint. Um, the refugee camps, so refugee camps is like the concrete jungle where everybody lives in this concrete place and my idea was this place, and I am a refugee, not, didn't live in a refugee camp, but I own nothing, just like every refugee, other refugee, and uh, uh, why we don't turn this into that without displacing people again and until they go back to their house, uh, to their to their lands. So rooftop farms like this in New York got famous, but we can do adaptations to Palestine. This project I did with the Ramallah municipality that Sally represents and she's with us. Uh, this rooftop uh, farm and this living furniture because we have very small spaces so we can recycle these pipes and other things to create also the garden and also the furniture at the same time, to use very small spaces to create something called the food forests, which is imitating the forest in its structure and communication to, to provide plants. So all of these are almost food plants or plants that support each other in a way. And this log will create fungi, this uh, rock will create bacteria and so on. It's so good without the light. So vertical gardens, of course, because the space is very small, like any urban environment, is so nice to, to go up and use the space like this uh, project I've done with schools. Uh, more and more people are asking for it. Uh, the river ecosystem in our homes can be adapted. This is maybe crazy stuff for some people or strange, but uh, we land already from lakes and rivers how to grow food without soil uh, in an organic way, having the fish in the water without, uh, just like having the chicken in the garden. So uh, basically fish poop, the bacteria helps with uh, filtration and the plants then drink that and the water goes back clean. Stuff like that I did for schools. Uh, Dominica, am I, am I good with time? Not yet. Okay, so uh, grey water systems, uh, uh, um, honey on the roofs, uh, and it, I will not go through that. But uh, actually, refugees are doing these kind of things. So it's not I'm not a crazy guy th thinking about crazy stuff. But actually, they're looking into the same materials, doing the same things, um, even making income through healing with plants. So. Yeah, I have to, to stop here, but you know, this is the tip of the iceberg, but I don't have more Thank time. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, do we have any immediate questions? Can you continue? Because the public space is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay with that? Like, I will not have you? other questions, so I, later on you can get Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so this is very simple in this sense in, uh, the, in Jerusalem, in Zahra Street, uh, already a research is done by the Palestinian Art Court, how since 67 this street was not changed at all because of the municipality of Jerusalem and Israeli municipality doesn't allow any change in the public space. So our reaction was to transform this rooftop to, uh, to something that is more uh, used and nice and provides uh, food and accommodates people. Uh, we used the garbage from the, the electrical company. Uh, again, you can see the walls here. We surpassed it by building massive buildings already. Uh, so we collected this garbage from the electrical company. We created this space and now uh, a, a bigger uh, organization took over doing the sa almost similar things on the 
entire street. So that was the ripple effect. That was the green virus we were exactly hoping for. So, and I'm very proud of hanging two trees, two Palestinian trees on the wall. Uh, this is called the Palestinian Art Court, and these trees are wild Palestinian, very beautiful and art artistic trees, uh, very beautiful for the court of the house. Uh, they're called the strawberry tree or kotlob in Arabic. And uh, these plants died. I didn't do these pots actually by the contractor. He did them. He didn't uh, ask me what, how he should do them. But the uh, water was cut and all this is dry. But these two trees, because they're planted in top pots, they lived one month and a half without any water. And this was like a huge test for me that this is really needed because one day we will not have water. And so, to what extent your ideas about food sustainability are, you know, spread out in the West Bank? I was really shocked yesterday when Haldun uh, told us uh, mm. at the dinner table that 90% of uh, mm. food in Gaza mm. was produced in Gaza. Mm. Uh, so, how about how about Actually, the West Bank? I, I feel. Uh, like a small ant, I don't know what is my effect. I know personal people who try to garden and do things. Uh, uh, I can flip through these uh, actually photos that shows this uh, interaction with designers, local youth, fewer opportunity kids in the old city, uh, making permaculture design courses certified from uh, international uh, uh, schools, teaching day and night. Uh, but even uh, beyond me being there, we try to make DIY videos so to spread this knowledge. But how much I did really affect, this was for example on the TV, we were hosted, this university students were uh, presenting this videos and what we learned in them, this practical information of how to do things. Uh, uh, but uh, statistically, I don't know this working with farmers in Area C, talking about microorganisms that they understand and so on. Uh, but percentage, I don't know, you know, we're talking now, it's more and more that people are talking about agri-resistance, if we go back to the word resistance, in a positive connotation actually back home, where actually this word is being raised, you know, that uh, doing uh, agriculture is a way of staying and being and surviving and, and making a voice and even uh, doing a change and challenging uh, uh, a lot of local and uh, Israeli uh, status. Yeah, thank you so much. And and, and, and maybe just to add to, for, for some of the Polish audience that might not be aware that Palestinian farmers in, in the West Bank are really struggling sometime to, sometimes to even get to their land uh, and have been losing their, their, their land in big proportions for the past 40 years. So, so this idea about growing your own food uh, I think it's really important and, and, and speak to the heart of, 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 of the struggles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and Yasmin, your turn. Okay, hi. Uh, everyone. Uh, so I went to um, Palestine uh, last year uh, to residency, but uh, first of all, uh, that was the um, uh, first part of it. It was uh, research. Uh, I met a lot of people, but also I met Mohammed. And I think you, you already know <laughs> why I was collaborating with him, because his knowledge and uh, his knowledge is uh, so uh, big and, and uh, he, he's working with societies and he uh, he is very involved to um, to this uh, to to all of this mm, and uh, i had to make something uh, for calandia biennale and i i started thinking that uh, i don't want to make any piece of art i just uh, i just wanted i just uh, wanted to be useful somehow and when i met mohammed uh, our en energy was changing uh, exchanging not changing uh, so that's why uh, 
uh, we were speaking a lot um, and uh, we uh, we decided to make uh, this uh, video manual uh, but also its story about uh, Mohammed itself I think uh oh yes maybe I uh, uh, I will read I will read um, something which uh, Mohammed uh, told me. Okay. <clears throat> Blue was the color of the barrel I was dragging around from one place to the next while I was in England participating in a panel about building gardens in refugee camps. At some point, the blue giant thing had become like my traveling suitcase rolling behind me as I moved from one place to the other. It was then that I was realized that I was dragging my garden around the way I have been holding my life around, a nomad, lost, and in search of his identity that has been blurred by a um, multitude of experiences in a world of shrinking spaces. But my barrel, my garden, was my grounding place. It was my true refuge, my therapy, my home and my, and my truth. So maybe we should... Uh
have any follow-up questions to Yasmina? Yasmina, just one, one question from, from me about, you know, like, sort of your decision process. How did you decide to work with Mohammed? And, and I just wonder what really, what really drove you to, 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 to this particular project and, and story. Uh, uh, does it anyhow relate to, you know, like, your, 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 your previous works? And, you know, when you think about the characters of, you, of, of, of your previous project, um, um, was there something, that w I'm sure there were many particular things about Palestine, but it, what, what, what it, it, is that, is it, it's a very kind of me sociologist asking weird question, um, is it about really human condition that you're looking after or there was something about particular Palestinian condition mm -hmm. of the occupation that, that, that drove you to, to the story? Uh, I don't know. It was uh, it was really natural to uh, to collaborate with uh, Mohammed. It was like that's it, and and yeah, and um, it was my first time in Palestine, so uh, it was really extremely um, experience for me, uh, and I I didn't even know what could I do there. Um, till the moment that I met Mohammed, mm, it, it's exchanged a lot. And Mohammed was uh, very mm, familiar for me. It was clear for me what, uh, what he's doing there, how important it is, uh, his work and this... Um, um, because we made this film about Mohammed, but also like a manual for the people. Uh, Mohammed told us uh, today about independence, so for me it was like a little light in dark uh, place, uh, and, and I catch it and uh, I will follow, I, I was follow. I don't know if I uh, answer your question, but... Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's wonderful. And I really like what you said about light. And I would really like to connect it to, Mohammed, what you said at the very beginning about your parents and how you grew up uh, uh, listening to your, your parents and, and, and their take on what, it, what, what was going on. And then how you felt that you, you needed to do something, possibly something different. And I also know that you didn't want to talk about generational differences, but I think one thing that uh, that is striking for me when I when I when I when I listen to uh, about your project is is this kind of I don't really want to sound overtly optimistic, but that but this sort of can-do spirit, this kind of looking for things that are possible to 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 do and and really focus on them and 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 to work on your thing, no matter what's the, what's, what's, what's the bigger picture. So... Uh, Think local. Yeah. So my question is, is my kind of gut feel interpretation right? Is that how you feel? Or maybe you feel completely different? And it's a question to, 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 to all of you. And also, how about, you know, your, 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 your friends, the artist communities, the activist communities, um, with which you share, share some of this work and, and stories back in back in Palestine. And, and yeah, well, please, like, if you could, like, Njumana also, if you could respond to this, Mohammed. Uh, so, um, I remember two things that affected me back in the days and actually uh, affects uh, my choice of doing something like that without being so direct. Uh, one of them is that I realized that if hope dies, even if you're still alive, then you, they win. The oppressor wins. Uh, so this is like, I was really small and I'm thinking, the hope must not die, so I have to be able to do something. Um, and the second thing is, I remember when I was a teenager, uh, listening for the first time to news that brought the Palestinian in a positive way, and it was not an, at all about the conflict. It was about one chemist, originally from Palestine, who came across a formula in chemistry. And that was all over the news. And for uh, just a little 
uh, boy the, uh, listening to so much negativity, uh, that was like, wow, what? Uh, we can be in a positive connotation. So I asked myself, what is it that I'm listening to? And I realized that uh, basically he followed what he likes the most or what he does the best and he succeeded in that. So I thought, I think the formula for every Palestinian from my mind is we need to follow our passion, whether it's to dance, to garden, to build, to, uh, to tell stories, to cook, whatever it is, uh, uh, we need to follow that, not just to follow mainstream, even if it's not from the Israeli, from our own culture, we need to follow that. So these are the two things that put me in this uh, direction and uh, in the end, it appeared to be combined with work with nature. Uh, and it's very important, it's not only to work with nature because we're not isolated. I'm a human as a biological creature and I belong to a society, so it must connect to that as well. So the link was not that I'm excited about gardening in, in per se, like I've never gardened before. Uh, and as refugees, uh, which you mentioned, uh, I was not raised in a, in a farming way at all. I have never seen any gardening or farming in my life, except for climbing on the trees and eating the fruits uh, and seeing my grandfather once weeding the, the soil, and that's it. So uh, uh, this combination between human and earth and solution for our problems, whatever it is, uh, combined with your own passion, is uh, uh, the, the formula for what drove me in this direction. Jumana? What's the question? Um, it was a long question. Mm. Possibly. The question was, well, well like, is, like, like, the question is first about this generational differences. Is, is the way you think about your artistic endeavors, but also the way in which you look at what is going on and what is possible. Is that different than, than for the generation of your parents? And how do you, how do you, you know, how do you place your work? Because my interpretation was that it was, um, it was very, like, uh, Jasmine has used the word light, it was very, but for me it was also very kind of positive, very Full of, like full of optimism. Uh, so I wonder uh, whether my interpretation is right and how, you, how do you consider your work in a kind of wider context? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't. So how do you, like, so, so, so I'm just also interested, how, how do you, you know, like, how do you start it as a project? How did how did you you know how did you become interested in in this? Uh, in how 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 did your childhood memory about uh, those folk take, tales? Mm. How 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 did they make into becoming a project of, of you as an adult? Mm. Thank you. Monica. I'm sorry. I'm just a bit sick, so I apologize if I'm a bit slow. But I mean, for me, the the. The entrance into this project uh, was, as I said, very much coming from an autobiographical place. It was how does it mean to reconnect to a place? And because in being Palestinian, we at least used to be, we used to be very much about the community, whether it was the family, the community of the family, <clears throat> or the community of the neighborhood, or the community of al Hosh, the courtyard, um, you know, it was, or the community of the village. And that's how, as well, we, we, we shared the land, the garden, the homes, the food, the, you know, the, you know, we even had, like, uh, family marriages. I mean, it was, you know, that, that there are generations of, of the past, before me, that uh, grew up with this, um, with this one way, and, or knowing how to survive, was through a community, through the, um, yeah, through, through the platform of the community. And I believe that now this uh, has become less and less um, uh, livable. Like, we're not living as communities. We're rarely living as communities today. Um, and, you know, whether we're leaving the village to go to live in the cities, or whether we're leaving the country altogether, you know, there is, obviously, there is something about occupation that, can become exhausting, and uh, so when we also speak about the 
resistance. Now, if I speak to uh, my elders, some of them just say, you know what, just live. And, and I don't know whether that has to do with the fact that they, it's not about that they are, they've seen too much and have, uh, they've witnessed too much, but have also experienced very little in the terms of, uh, in the form of answers. So they've experienced a lot of challenges, but where, have, where are the answers? And for me personally, why I, I kind of magnetized, you know, I went, uh, my attraction to the stories was, um, was also perhaps what always attracted us to the stories, even as children, and even as the storytellers, because there was always the promise of a happy ending. So no matter the process of that story, no matter how many times your hands might have been cut off, or you know you had to go on this long adventure and fight monsters and climb pomegranate trees, and see your you know see lions uh, transform into boys and and boys drink poisoned water and turn into birds, I mean all of these tales were um, were not were not easy, but there was one thing that was always certain about them: there was always a promise for a happy ending. And perhaps that's what our parents, our ancestors, perhaps what my grandparents wanted to give me, if there couldn't be a promise of the physical material place, the link before the physical material accessibility uh, was the promise of uh, the hope, you know, having that uh, hope. That let me tell you a story and it will have a happy ending no matter how horrific it may be. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, I think it's really time to, to open the floor for, uh, for some questions or maybe reflections from, from, from our audience. Um. Yes, I have a question for Jumana actually and uh, <laughs> are you tired? I can skip the question. <laughs> well, I mean, it was fascinated, I, uh, fascinating. I really enjoyed uh, each single uh, piece of it. And actually, it also brings me to asking you if this is the story of return, right? I mean, in many ways, we are all the time constantly speaking about the Palestinian right of return, the Palestinian right of return, without realizing where this might be taking us. And actually, you were even brought uh, fairly young to Palestine at 12 years old and still facing until now the whole idea of what returns might mean for you and how you would reconnect back to Palestine. And a lot of time also it, it I mean, while you were speaking, it reconnected me a lot, of, a lot of refugees with whom I work and was speaking about the return as if it is about alienating 70 years of exile and come back as if nothing happened, right? And what I find really, really fascinating about your story and your connection is that you are finding in your own ways a way to return back to what home might be. And, and in that sense, you know, I sort of reconnected back with me that I don't have the same, I mean, I, I was very much rooted in a place like Beit Sahur and actually given very strong roots. And yet, my all issue is that what does home mean in other senses? Can I have other homes, right? So I really find what, what you brought for us was really an amazing reflection, not only on storytelling that you do in such a beautiful way and, and, and I wish we can still be, actually as a mother also, I wish we can still, and I realize what you say, I mean, I was thinking, can I ever, if Jumana would visit me, my daughters would be silent and hearing this as we did with my grandparents or, or did we lost this forever? And in that sense, you know, I, I don't know, there is something very strong out of not only storytelling, but almost show a possible way to return and not to give up with this idea of right of return as it is impossible because I'm, I'm almost thinking that we are arriving there while what you are bringing to us is quite a super interesting way of different kinds of return back home or claiming home in a different manner. So I would love to hear your uh, reflections on this and if you ever thought about, and if the story that you told, I mean, I read a bit the story at the beginning of the story of return when Almaza was explaining that she lost everything. Was it 
However, is it connected, not connected? It was like by chance or, you know, I would like to hear more. Yeah, I mean, for sure the stories, when I tell them, I've, I've changed them a bit and I've added to them uh, various parts of current, uh, you know, current life or, or real life. And, uh, and I also sometimes even mix between several Palestinian folktales and I mix them and I just create one folktale or I change the names. And um, I mean, for me in a way, the story is about what you own. You may not have, you know, you may have lost the, the, the permit to go back home. You may have lost the land, the property that is rightfully yours. But there's something about story that you can own. And nobody has any jurisdiction on your story. So find your story. And then maybe that could be a way of return. And it's very interesting what you're saying because I, find, I found that my, my first work was actually a piece where I tried to, uh, it was literally called The Return. And, uh, and it was a piece where I followed the Hansel and Gretel story of when the children are placing pieces of bread in a forest path so that they don't get lost and they know how to return home. And I was basically just reenacting that act and placing pieces of bread behind me. So there is always this question mark, when, when do we ever reach it? You know, and I don't think that we, I don't know if that is, if we have the answer, but I feel it beyond a doubt that we own stories and they have to be, and that's one of the things that every, any, um, any oppressor wants to take, before they take your land, they've actually taken the story about that land. And that becomes even more powerful than the land that they've thieved away. The fact that they've also taken those words that belong to that land. Any other questions? Comments, reflections? Thank you. I want to ask uh, Jumana about her relationship to Canaan. I know you're interested in haunted springs and um, um, peasant uh, religion and magic. And Canaan, of course, was an ethnographer. So he, he invented things, but in a, in a different way than you invent things. But um, can you tell us something, how you relate to him? Do you, do you think of yourself as a Canaanite? Uh, or uh, <laughs> how, how do you see your narrative different from Canaan? And how do you see Canaan's work as illuminating your work? I, mean, I feel that we are all connected, no matter what generation we are or what... Uh, you know, what, uh, what year we were born. As Palestinians, and no matter where we're living, I feel that there are certain, there's a link between all of us. And when I came across Canaan's work, I felt that, that I understood immediately that his research was, you know, was offering a, another format than what I was interested in. But I wanted to use that as a, a he was my teacher, actually. When I now, you know, reflect back on it, I felt like his work, and I continue to go back to his studies and writings that he, he's written and his research and you know what has also been written about him. And I find that he is, for me, uh, a teacher. It doesn't mean that a teacher means that he's all righteous. It doesn't mean that what you learn from a teacher, like your teacher is not the only source of learning. There are many forms of learning. So Canaan has been one source of learning for me. The landscape has been another very vital source of learning. And I felt like Canaan helped to, to connect me, to offer me that, uh, that additional information that uh, initially on a more like uh, human level, when I was trying to ask people in the early uh, um, days of, my, uh, of this particular project, it was so difficult to find concrete answers. People just didn't want to talk about the stories they knew or the talismans they carry or the haunted uh, rivers and uh, springs. And so for me, it was uh, you know, that intimate uh, study, the library of information that Canaan offered for me was, uh, was at least a source of departure. Uh, there is a very little known 
a monograph by Canaan on the religion of Petra. Are you, are you familiar with it? No. I mean, he claims that the religion of Petra was also the religion of Palestine. And uh, the, it was mostly phallic worship that, that Petra, uh, and I think that's one reason the, this monograph is not reprinted. It's a sort of scandalous part of his work, but I was wondering if you, you're familiar with it. No, thank you, I will I'll try to look it up. <laughs> yes, more radical stories. Any other comments or questions? It's just a very brief comment for Muhammad. I think, uh, I don't know if it's your work directly or projects influenced by your project or if it's just spread a bit more in the West Bank. But the uh, Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, uh, some of them in the South, they've been doing some of these rooftop gardens and as a form of income generation to make the spaces look a bit nicer, you know, refugee camps are concrete jungles. And I know for, I watched a video, I can't remember on which channel, that the idea came from the West Bank so the idea is spreading one way or the other. And I know the site rooftop gardens are not just in Palestine, but this one was, the inspiration came from the, from the West Bank to Lebanon uh, through communication. So I think there's positive impact one way or the other. Yep. Okay. So I have more of a comment actually, because I, watching the video, I loved it so much, and I, I think I nominate that this video with Muhammad also eating those delicious vegetables which have made me crave <laughs> onions and, and tomatoes and basil. I, I really want you to find a huge billboard, and every billboard you can find, and uh, present this video. <laughs> like uh, billboards in the streets, in the public spaces. Okay, so I have to add something also because I am extremely touching of your stories, Jumana, really. I am extremely, I am speechless right now, so maybe after this panel I will speak more <laughs> with you. So a very quick one because we are running. This is a very, very easy I'm question. Sorry. So I'm, I'm wondering how the, because you say you work in Bethlehem, how does the local municipality view your work? How do you work with the, the administration? And is, is the, are there some channels who are interested in presenting um, art in terms of public, um, or like reseeding and replanting and reforestation in terms of uh, Bethlehem and uh, Palestine? Palestine? Uh, so uh, that little head had grass on his head because I wanted to say that I, am, uh, I, I work in a grassroot way like really bottom up. I don't uh, uh, have any communication with uh, decision in influencers. Uh, sometimes they approach me to do things. So if, for example, in Bethlehem, I work mostly in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and Jericho, this, this triangle. And uh, Dar Jasser, for example, in Bethlehem, approached me to, to be an, a resident there. Um, and uh, the work I have did is, which I couldn't show, was uh, to make an urban farm in a very small spot on the, in the city, which are abandoned, abandoned and abundant, there is a lot of them, uh, to be able to grow crops in a, in, a, in a very profitable way because they're being eaten by the mega corporations uh, of agriculture. Uh, so I use that. It's, it's not artistic at all. If you stand there, there's nothing about it that uh, looks artistic. It's really a research on how to be financially sustainable in this sense uh, uh, and then provide this uh, learning process to them because they know how to farm. But the management and the marketing is the two bits that we need to find a simple way for them to be to elevate and to become uh, uh, to to have more dignity in their work instead of becoming a taxi driver or working in Israel and so on. Uh, so a solution, because the money, uh, from my experience, is the only thing that in the end comes. You talk about 
ecology, they understand uh, resistance, everything, I mean, uh, whatever you call it, uh, but, uh, you know, staying. Uh, but the bit of money is really hard. So in this sense, uh, this is local organization approached me and asked me to do such a thing. But in the art sector, I'm really new. Uh, I was not thinking to do art at all. I was, I was thinking to be a peasant, a farmer, somebody who actually experiment, study, read, having the privilege of knowing uh, another language, bringing the information from all around the world, doesn't need to be from the West, and bring it there, implement it, and then it just spreads, as, as, as you said. History. Sorry? It's history. Yeah. I'm afraid our time is up, right? Uh, thank, you, thank you so much for sharing your stories, your emotions, uh, being so reflexive. Thank you to our lovely audience. It was really a pleasure to, 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 to share this time with you. And we will have another panel soon, right? Yes, we have another panel, but I really want to thank you like, thank for you. your generosity. It was uh, amazing to hear your stories.